I want to speak directly today. Please take these words to heart. I don't know what stage of your life's journey you're at right now. I don't know what you are going through or what you have been through as a person. But there is one thing that I do know. Where you are right now, what you are going through right now, that is a condition, not your conclusion. This is not a mere motivation. This is the word of God coming to you through me today. For somebody, somewhere, right now. This is the answer to that question you have been asking God in your secret place. Your life may have taken a turn at some point that got you questioning your very existence itself. Maybe you are not at that point yet, but you are not satisfied with where you are. This message is from God to you. I want you to know that life does not always go the way we want them to go. You may try all you can, but things must just go sideways. No one knows why or how to avoid that. It is like a blind spot on your visions or blueprint. We do not always see, and we can't miss it. When they happen, they can be very unnerving, discouraging, and depressing. In fact, many people have fallen into depression because of some of life's disappointments. The fact that things did not go as they planned shattered that dream, and they lost hope of ever achieving anything. Now hear me. You may not be where you always dreamed you'd be now. However, you are not where you used to be. No matter how slow the pace, you are not the same person twice. It is either you are getting better or you are getting worse. With each passing day, you get closer to becoming somebody in life. How you handle where you are now goes a long way in determining how you turn out. When you are in the least place that you can be, there is so much in store for you up ahead. Where you are now is nothing compared to it. The Bible says in Job chapter 8, verse 7, Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. There is one thing that the enemy likes to do to our minds when things seem to go out of proportion for us. He tries to make us believe that all hope is gone, and this is the end. However, it is through messages like this that our minds will break free from such deceit. Therefore, before you start concluding on yourself, you must realize that where you are as a child of God does not define who you are, what you've done, or where you are going. The story of Job is a great example. The man that loses all his children and all his possessions in one day must have done something quite terrible, right? That is what it would seem like from face value. Even his closest friends thought that of him too. They did not believe that someone could experience any such thing without having done something wrong. They believed that this was fate. This was God dishing out judgment on Job, and that Job should repent instead of insisting he didn't do anything wrong to deserve this. You see, we might even think the same thing if the Bible had not told us what had happened behind the scene. Satan had gone to challenge God over Job's life, daring God to push Job to the wall to prove his loyalty. It wasn't God who did those things to Job, it was the devil. God allowed him because God knew Job. Here was God's own testimony of Job. Job chapter 1 verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And one thing about our Heavenly Father is that when He commends you, He doesn't do so because of what everyone else sees you doing. He does so because of what He sees inside your heart. He said to the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. He knew Job because he had seen his heart. Job wasn't worshiping because of the blessings, health, or good things God had blessed him with. He worshiped because he loved God and had submitted his life to him. This was why he could say during the height of his suffering, if a man die, shall he live again? 
All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. And also, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Job chapter 14, verse 14, and Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job understood something. What he was going through was terrible. It was bad. It was as bad as dying. He had lost everything. His children were all gone. His possessions were all gone. His wife, the closest ally he had, had lost faith and was pressuring him to curse God and die, implying that he was better off dead than alive given his current predicament. His health was in a terrible state. Friends that were supposed to comfort him were condemning him instead. However, Job knew and believed that God would never let him end like that without vindicating him. He believed this with all his heart, and truly, that was what happened. God showed up and turned his story around. Everything he lost, he got back much more. Your current situation might feel like a nightmare. Let me tell you, however, that nightmares, no matter how long or terrible, always end. No matter how long a traffic jam, with a little time, it must come to an end. No matter how terrible the storm, if you live long enough, you will see its end. Psalms chapter 30 verse 5 For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. This reminds me of a story I heard some time ago of a father and his daughter. They were driving home one cool evening when a storm started. It was raining down hail so hard that they could hardly see the car in front of them. This young girl was so scared, she covered herself under her dad's jacket so she couldn't see the thunder and lightning that tore through the sky. She could, however, see all the other cars they had driven past them earlier all parked by the side of the road. They couldn't see the road in front of them either, and to avoid an accident, they had stopped. She wondered why her dad didn't stop, just kept driving. Then there was silence. She lifted herself up to lights in front of her, the trees and the birds singing as they drove past. This was when her dad decided to park the car by the side of the road. Then he turned to her and asked her what she had observed. She said they had been driving a long time in a storm, but now the storm was gone. He told her to look back, and she did. When she looked back, she saw that far behind them, the storm wasn't gone. It wasn't moving, but it wasn't stopping either. He turned back to him and told them that the storm was still there. Then he told, You see, my little one, I want you to learn this lesson today. What you have just witnessed is a narrative of how life can look like sometimes. I have just taught you something I want you to remember for the rest of your life. Aside the fact that each one of us driving entered the storm at different times, how long we would stay in that storm would depend on us. Don't get me wrong, I didn't say you will control the storm. Instead, I am saying that you control the storm's effect on you. Did you notice the other cars parked by the side of the road? As long as they are parked there within the storm, they remain under the effect of the storm. If the storm will last 12 hours, as long as they choose to park there, they will remain there for 12 hours. However, because we kept moving, here we are watching. Although the storm still exists, it has no more power over us. We are done with the storm. Remember the story, my friend. When you face the storms of life, don't give up. Don't conclude that it is the end of the journey for you. Don't park by the roadside. Don't resign to fate. Don't settle in that condition. Your storm will only be as long as you make it. The current condition you are in is not your conclusion. It is not your destiny. It is not your destination. If you keep your eyes in the right direction and your trust too, you will reach it. Where is the right direction? It is God. Where should your trust be? It should be on God. Psalms 121 verses 1 through 4. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
So long as God is your source, your vehicle, he will bring you out of the storm. He will cause everything to turn around for your good. Yes, it may not look like it today or right now, but don't let where you are discourage you. It does not determine your destination. Focus your heart on God's promises, on God's grace, on God's mercies. Through grace and mercy, God is able to take a messed up condition and turn it around. Look at the life of Paul. Once upon a time, he was a murderer, a zealot willing to kill anyone who stood in his way. He would say such a one would end in destruction, but no, God had a different plan. Through one encounter, he turned his murdering zealot into one of the greatest apostles of the faith this world has ever seen. From Saul the murdering zealot to Paul the beloved apostle, my friend, don't give up yet. Like that storm, maybe your condition seems like it will last forever. I am here to tell you that it won't. If you will let Jesus take the wheels of your destiny, he will navigate it in the right direction. Out of every negative condition, turning everything around to your testimony. Like Job, God can make the instrument that once brought you reproach to be the same object of your testimony. Why? Because his plans for you are for good and not for evil, to give you an unexpected end, a future, and a hope. Do you see that? The condition is just a bump in the road. Don't stop because of it. It may slow you down, but don't let it stop you. Keep your eyes on God. Put your trust in Him. Don't try to work it out by yourself. No, it will not wear you out. Instead, let His strength replace yours. When you come to the end of yourself, then God can reveal His full ability on your behalf. When He is through with you, your life will look too good to be true. Yes, because He is that kind of God. I decree over your life today in faith and I want you to believe and receive this declaration. The Lord our God will stand with you. He will help you. He will deliver you. He will show himself strong on your behalf. The darkness, the storms, the reproach may ravage you right now, and it may look like you have been abandoned. But no, you are not. God will grant you the grace to keep your eyes on him. He will uphold you with his strong right arm. You won't give up, give in, or give out. Inside, out of the messy condition, God will bring you into your miracle. Things will turn around for your good by the power of God's hand. In Jesus' name, amen. All Christians know that there is only one genuine God and the only way to contact him is through Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, he plainly said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We come to God by believing in Jesus Christ and the redemption that he secured for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible shows us in the book of Genesis that God is the creator of heaven and earth and it functions in accordance with the laws he put in place. For instance, we have day and night due to the role of the sun, and the moon, which gives us light by night, is a reflection of the sun. There are also spiritual laws such as faith. Our understanding and harnessing of the laws of God are crucial if we are to succeed in this world. We also need to understand that he made the laws for our benefit now that you have come to know God through Jesus Christ, it is very important for you to recognize that He is a Father to you in the same way that Jesus related to Him as a Father. Having a wrong perspective on God has far-reaching implications in our walk with Him. For example, if you believe that God gets angry each time you err, you will not enjoy a stable and healthy relationship with Him you will become too conscious of your inadequacies to boldly approach him. But Jesus recognized God as a loving father who takes pleasure in his own. And this is the way he truly is. When you live with the consciousness that God is your loving father, 
it gives you a sense of self-worth, a much-needed tonic for a happy life. As a Christian, you know like an enemy that you have an invisible enemy called Satan. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, he is referred to as the God of this world. In other words, the systems of the world function according to his dictates. These include education, healthcare, entertainment, commerce, culture, politics, and every aspect of human life. They are all avenues through which Satan manipulates the lives of men, especially believers, in line with his evil agenda. But although you are in the world, you are no longer in Satan's domain. This is why he is desperately opposed to you. He knows that your testimony can deliver those he has held captive all their lives. The Bible shows in Colossians 1.13 that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. This is why it is imperative that you depend on God. You cannot afford to be passive. You see, Satan does not give up on you because you are a Christian. In fact, he makes you his primary target. But through prayer, you frustrate him. Prayer is not a religious routine, nor is it an obligation you carry out to please God. Prayer is engaging God so that you can make your way in life. And the basis for prayer is the Word of God. If you do not study the Bible regularly, you will not be effective in prayer. You will not know whether or not you are praying correctly. No matter how gifted you are as God's son or daughter, you will not be able to excel if you rely solely on yourself or your fellow men. Look at the prayer in Psalm 60, 11. It is also found in Psalm 108, 12. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Psalm 60, 1. God truly wants to help you, but you must be willing to call upon Him in faith. If you want to make significant progress in life, get ready for battles at every stage. In fact, whether or not you know it, being in Christ means that you are in contention with Satan's setup. Look at Ephesians 6.12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You cannot see these demonic beings, but they attack your mind with thoughts of discouragement and stir up opposition against you from unexpected sources. The aim of these bombardments is to weaken your confidence in prayer. They also try to meddle with your finances to hinder your advancement. It is only through prayer that you can subdue these forces when you pray to God, He gives you insight from His Word to navigate through the barriers that you come across. As you pray, God also dispatches angels to combat demonic beings that war against you. Apart from the natural challenges of life, there are spiritual activities that influence what we do, causing all sorts of problems. The way to subdue them is through fervent prayers. If you don't pray, you will be stuck, not knowing what to do. Sometimes there are people appointed by God to play key roles in your life. As you pray, God will bring them your way and open their hearts to you. If you are confused about what to do concerning an issue, take time to pray. Also meditate on God's word. Don't make hasty decisions on any crucial matter. Sooner or later, there will be clarity and you will know what to do. There might be mysteries about your life, family, or career that can only be unraveled when you pray to God, who knows all things. In some cases, your destiny is tied to the unraveling of such mysteries, so you must pray. Prayer can make you a problem solver in the workplace. You receive answers to complex matters, and this will bring you promotion. Just think of Daniel, a young Hebrew slave in the land of Babylon, and how he interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and got promoted even though he was a slave in a foreign land. His secret was prayer. Don't rely on anyone's prayer. 
It is your burden. You have a Bible that teaches about prayer, and you also have the Holy Spirit to help you. So don't give excuses for being prayerless because your life depends on it. Attend prayer meetings and make friends with people who have learned to pray. God has great plans for you, but you cannot access and actualize them unless you are prayerful. Wake up at night or in the early hours and look for a solitary place to avoid distractions. Praying in tongues under your breath constantly is a good idea. You can do it almost anywhere at all times, and it keeps your mind focused on God. There are several more benefits of prayer, especially when you do it consistently. Prayer fine-tunes your thinking and aligns it to the Word of God so that you don't struggle to know what God wants you to do at any time. When you carefully consider the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, you will observe that Satan kept making enticing suggestions to him with the aim of getting him to compromise his divine assignment. But Jesus was victorious all the way through because he knew and spoke what was written in the scriptures. The words of Jesus were powered by prayers. The Bible shows us that immediately after John baptized him in the River Jordan, he prayed, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him. And when you are spiritually minded, Satan cannot take advantage of you. A praying person is bold and focused. Satan cannot easily knock him off course, especially when he is well-founded in God's Word. There will be times when you don't feel like praying, but pray as an act of will rather than relying on feelings. When you are trained to pray consistently, it soon becomes a delight, especially when you start noticing the transformation it brings. The secret of Christians who enjoy the gifts of the Spirit is fervent prayers. Prophecy, discernment of spirits, words of knowledge, and the others flow through the life of a praying believer in Christ Jesus. Don't settle for an ordinary life. Make prayer your priority. Signs and wonders will surely follow you. Greatness and influence in the kingdom of God are not possible without the commitment to prayer. Do you want to win your family? Do you wish to end an ugly trend around you? It is possible through prayer. You don't have to tolerate the status quo. You alone can turn things around. God can do so much through one man. Prophet Elijah alone shook the land of Israel and subdued the prophets of Baal. Not even King Ahab or his evil wife Jezebel could stop him. Take up the challenge and start praying. You have equal access to God with men and women of God who did exploits many years ago. Don't stop crying over the situation. Start doing something about it today. Read the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and get inspired by the account of people who walked with God and impacted their world through prayer. Furthermore, you need to know that persistence is a vital ingredient in prayer. There are issues that will not change by praying for hours, days, weeks, or even months. It will take several years. So, you must be determined not to give up, no matter how long it takes. When you pray continually over an issue, things happen that are not immediately apparent. But you lose it all when you quit. Learn from the prophet Elijah. He did not stop praying for rain until there was a visible sign in the sky that a heavy downpour was inevitable. There is no hopeless case before God who raises the dead. Actually, praying effectively is not totally dependent on the length of time spent. After all, Jesus simply called out to Lazarus from the grave, who had been dead for four days. But there should be a willingness on your part to persist in prayer until the desired results are gotten. Spending a lot of time with God is something you should do in your closet. During such times, God will deal with your doubts. You will receive His guidance and wisdom so that when you step out, you will be bold and full of faith. A simple prayer will then suffice because you know exactly what to do. And much of your prayers in the closet should take the form of praising worshiping, and giving thanks. 
have a pen and paper close by so you can write down whatever he says to you. It is your greatest benefit in the closet. Trusting God to turn things around? What do you mean? How much do you trust God? Enough to turn impossible things into possible ones? Issues that seem to look life-threatening? Is it easy to trust God exclusively to turn things around? Absolutely. Trusting God means believing in the ability of God completely. Are there things that God cannot do? Not one. My trust in the awesomeness of God is second to none. I would like to introduce my God who can do all things for you. Although we are completely in a world that's devoid of trust, if only you can trust God to turn things around for you, then you will experience the total ramifications of His awesomeness. What God can do will completely raise your confidence in Him. I have no iota of doubt about the efficacy of who God is. I know God can turn things around. I know He can do exceedingly above all things. Only God can turn your situation around. There's nothing He can't do. All you need to do is believe in Him and trust Him for the positive change in your life. No situation is too hard or impossible for God to handle. He is God today and forever. He does unimaginable things. If you're facing desperate circumstances, God's help is available to turn the situation around. Let us look at the scriptures. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. There is nothing too hard for God. He is limitless in power and ability. Things that appear impossible to us as humans are nothing in comparison to him. There's no sickness or problem too great for God to overcome. He's the almighty God and his power is able. He is able, abundantly able, to deliver and save. Only God is able to rescue anyone from the gutters of life. As you surrender to God, we are aware that there are situations in life that God needs to turn around. Let us look at a few of them, as we can't exhaust them all. Human problems are as numerous as their wants. Family life. A lot of homes that started in love are now in disarray. The home is broken, and the children are separated from the love of a good family. The husband's in another woman's arms. So also, women in the arms of a strange man. Home is scattered. But do you know what? There is nothing God cannot do. He can heal all wounds, restore the home, and reunite the bereaved. All you need to do is call upon him and he will answer. Relationship difficulties. So many people in the world have these challenges, but God can fix them. He can bring people of different races, colors, and languages together. Connect them together and bless them with unmerited favor. In a miraculous way, He would give you your partners. Are you trusting God for healing, deliverance, or ailments? Take it to God. He will heal your wounds. All you need to do is put your faith to work. Faith is evidence of things not seen but hoped for. You did not see it physically, but you believe that it will happen and the world will see it. All you need to do is flee from every appearance of evil. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 Run away from evil desires, anything that contradicts the word of God. Pursue righteousness and peace with all men. So, how do you put your faith in God? Trust God completely. Don't let your emotions rule your world, but go to God on your knees. Pray fervently, and God Almighty will come to your aid. God cherishes His words more than anything, 
So therefore, use his words in the Bible. Get a scripture that suits your situation and make your request known to God. He will grant your inner heart's request. Confess your sins and surrender your unbelief. Be truthful, be honest. Tell him your secret sins. He will help you. You can trust God enough by sharing your concerns or challenges with him. He cares for you. He cares about your well-being. Tell God. This is to enable him to relieve you from the bitterness of this world. But no, there is nothing that happened to you that God is not aware of. But you should invite him into your life or situation. So what are you waiting for? Surrender your life to God now. What are you struggling with? Alcohol? Smoking? Womanizing? Lesbianism? Homosexuality and masturbation? Take it to God Almighty. He will heal you completely. Have you created time for God? You'd better do that now. A lot of people are so busy with different things. They'll tell you that they have no time to serve God. It's very important to create time for just 30 minutes to pray and study the Word of God. As you proceed, your timing will change and God will increase your quest for Him. The desire to pray more will also increase. Can you wait on God? Fast and ask Him for the monumental task that lies ahead of you. God will reveal to you better things to come. They who wait for the Lord will be renewed in strength. They will mount up with eagle's wings. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. You can't get tired of serving God. God is trustworthy, even when you don't see your prayers being answered or problems solved right away. God's timing is not our time. His timing for answering prayers is absolutely different. Life is unpredictable and difficult at times. And that difficulty may persist for longer than you'd hoped. A young man who waited said he was tired of waiting. He went and did abnormal things, and he lost his life. Why do you want to help God? Let God help you instead. At the appropriate time, God will do that. That will glorify his own name. It may even bring you to the end of your strength. Where your strength stops, God's grace starts. Let God Almighty into your life. Surrender your life to God Almighty. He will direct your path. Wait, trust, and remember that God loves you. You can trust him to sustain you, provide for your needs, and be with you even in the midst of your hardship. Jesus told his followers that they would face hard times. John 16, 33. But he promised that he would always be with them. Matthew 28, 20. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Most of us have faced disappointments and afflictions. Let us look at this scripture of the woman with the issue of blood. The woman with an issue of blood had spent all she had Mark 5, 25 to 26. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. I will use my personal testimony here. I bled for over 10 years with heavy bleeding. As soon as I was diagnosed with fibroids, I started medication that didn't work. I was booked for an appointment to have surgery. My doctor said it was 50-50, as age was not on my side. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit took charge? It was so clear, despite anesthesia. I saw clearly how after the surgery, an angel took me by the hand and said that I had an unfinished assignment to do. Behold, I woke up to life, and my healing was amazing to all that saw me. What health issues are you dealing with? Surrender it to God and He will heal you. Use God's Word. He will speed everything up. Are there things God's done for you? Oh no? Yes, He gave you life abundantly. You breathe now and forever. He provides for your needs. He clothes you. 
and you are walking and moving around. His grace is sufficient for you. Trust God and surrender to God. Visit the hospital and see how marvelous God is to you. Give thanks to God in all your ways. Can you work with the Holy Spirit? Ask the Holy Spirit for help. Working in obedience to Him, He'll guide you and support you where you're weak. Send Him your challenges. He will give you rest. Brethren, trust God to turn things around for you, and He will surely do so. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 11. God speaks to us, and we must train our ears to hear and distinguish His voice. We must put our faith in Him and act on what we hear. God has the ability to turn things around. Allow Him to transform your sadness into joy. I am completely certain that God can handle any circumstance and offer an answer to any query or problem. He has access to all the universe's resources to assist each of us in overcoming any crisis if we would trust Him. Only by getting to know God will we be able to learn to trust Him. We will have a distorted impression of Him if our understanding of Him is inadequate. You may not realize it yet, but faith is exactly what you've been yearning for your entire life. Faith keeps you going when things get tough. It can stay in your stomach for months or years before rising to comfort you when you need it the most. And your faith is as much in need of you as you are of it. Therefore, renew your faith and put your confidence in something bigger than yourself. Pray and leave the worrying to God. Don't just take it from us, but the Bible says in Joshua 1, 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Over millennia, mankind has struggled with the issue of trusting God. When faced with severe situations in our life on earth, it might be difficult to rely on God's omnipresence. Fortunately, because practically everyone faces this challenge, we may draw inspiration from the words of great people throughout history. Fear is blind and unable to predict the future. While Jesus knows the finish from the start, he has a plan in place to deliver relief in every situation. The more you go with the flow of life and give the result to God, the less you seek continual clarity, the more those wonderful things will begin to appear in your life. The Bible does not promise that we'll be spared from suffering or hardships. However, it does state that they will not stay permanently. We know that God will not leave us in our darkest hours. And in the end, he'll make everything right. How do I change my life? How do I make it stop? It is tearing me apart. I want to be better. I am done being a disappointment, but I still find myself stuck there. How do I break free? Where is it coming from? Have you ever found yourself thinking these thoughts about yourself or wishing them for someone else? I'd like you to know that somehow, at one point in time or the other, some of the best of us can admit to thinking these things too. There were things we so badly needed to change in our lives, but somehow it was as if we were stuck in a circle. However, we did break free. We took back control, and you can too. Can you remember your childhood days? I am sure you might. I am sure you can think of some things you did as a kid right now. Maybe even one specific situation where you did something. Maybe you can remember the feeling you had when you did what you did. However, there is something I am sure you cannot remember which took place before and while you were acting. It's what you had in mind, your thoughts. I have remembered some things I did as a kid, but I can't seem to put my hand on what I was thinking that made me do what I did. I never had an explanation to this. However, I do now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. 
You see, for children, thinking or giving attention to thoughts isn't a thing. Children act more through instinct than through careful consideration. And fun fact, children only think after acting. It is as we grow up that we turn the cards. Now we think before we act. This is what makes us grown-ups. This is what qualifies us to be called wise, mature, and civilized. As we grow up, we learn the value of the mind. We learn to use it. Because now, we know its value. We are very intentional about developing it. The child never thought of developing his mind. If he ever learned something, it was purely out of interest and never because they had some special, useful plan for the future. You could hear a child say that he or she would like to be a scientist when they grew up. But if you bring stuff around him to play with, whether he picks up science-related stuff or not, it isn't deliberately because of what he said, but because of what he wants to satisfy at that moment, his desire for what his eyes have seen. However, as you grow, you learn to think ahead. Allow your reflections to influence your choices and your engagements in the present. For the child, everything happens outside first before being established inside. But for the grown-up, everything starts from the inside out. Why do you think Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16? By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? You see, people may ask their thoughts through contrary actions, but somehow, if you do observe them with time, whatever it is they have in mind will come into fruition. We can only keep up and act for too long. Your mind and whatever goes on in there plays a huge role in determining many things in your life. Maybe you've never thought of this, my friend. Maybe you've never given careful consideration to the power of your mind before. Well, now I need you to know that you must. Someone once wrote, The battles of life are not fought on the plains of the land. Rather, they are first fought and won on the plains of the mind. My dear friend, your mind is a battlefield. Wars that are lost in the mind are never won in real life. And whatever war you win in your mind, you're sure to win right here. Your mind is that power. Every weapon you need is right there. The problem is that not many of us give so much attention to this. And so we are like soldiers sleeping on the battlefield with a war going, totally oblivious to the fact that we are being plundered and completely ravaged. Oh. But what a beauty it will be for the prepared mind. You're ready for whatever comes, and anything that comes in gets it. This is the trained mind. This is the mind that will win when the battle comes. See what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5. through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Where are strongholds formed? In your mind. Maybe you ask, what are strongholds? Strongholds are mental conditioning that affect our choices and lifestyle, even without us knowing or wanting to. For example, People who struggle with addictions aren't dealing with a mere habit. You won't beat it out of them. You can't talk it out of them in one single threat. They are delaying with a stronghold. When it places its demands on them, they do not know what to do with themselves anymore until they give in. Why? Because it holds them strong. That's why it's called a stronghold. The apostle makes it clear, therefore, that we win battles by tearing down strongholds, imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of who God is. How do these strongholds come? Through those things we allow access into our minds, and they take roots there. They could be information through sound, images, feelings, results, and so on. Again, be reminded that the strongholds you do not tear down in your mind will tear you down. The battles you fail to win in your head, you will fail to win in your life. In that place, guns, sticks, and missiles don't work. They have their own weapons there. 
Strongholds of the mind are the means through which the enemy attacks our minds and therefore our lives too. That frustration you are dealing with right now, the fight is in your mind. Are you struggling with depression? It is in your mind. Are you constantly catching yourself thinking insane thoughts, things you would not even have the heart to do in real life? Yes, it's coming from the mind plane, your battlefield, that struggle to forgive, that need to get attention even if you have to become who God did not make you. Those steady suicidal thoughts, those negative lifestyles you are prone to adopt more often, everything is in your mind. Maybe you are even a parent, a caretaker or some guardian. I would like you to know that whatever you witness people dealing with is the outcome of either an ongoing war in their mind or an already finished one. Their lives are the outcomes of whether they won the battle or they lost it. Focus on the battle in your head. It is time to focus on that battle going on within you. You have allowed it long enough. You have allowed Satan to mess with your life for far too long. You have allowed him to hold you handicapped for too long. It is time to break free. Time to take back control of your mind. Because when you do take back control of your mind, you take back control of your life. The transformation that you need in your life will begin the day that you begin to transform your mind. How will I take back control? How do I change my life and become better? I know I can, but I can't seem to get it right, even when I try my best. First, in winning these battles, especially as a Christian, please remember that your brute strength isn't what you put in front of you. Strong will isn't what you put in front either. These are good, but they are not going to be enough. You need help from God. You can be a born-again believer, but still be a loser in your head. Why? Because you see, it is your spirit that receives salvation, that gets saved, not your mind. Your mind has been the sole driver of your entire life before Christ, and now that through Christ full control has been restored to your spirit, you have to reprogram your mind to cooperate with your spirit as your spirit cooperates with Christ. That is where the fight is. Your spirit man is clean now, pure to its core because of the washing of the blood of Jesus. However, your mind isn't. It is your job to change that. How? Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. God, through Christ, has called us out of the world, but because we are still on earth today, we can still find ourselves struggling with things that we are supposed to have been saved from. We still witness sin, fear, shame, and reproach. We still witness wars, lies, and propaganda by wicked men in this world. We still witness immorality on and off the media. These things are steadily mounting pressures against our minds, and we have an assignment. And what is that? Renew your mind. Remember, it was not your mind that was saved, but your spirit. What your mind needs is not salvation like your spirit, but renewal. This renewal translates to a transformed life automatically. What does this mean, you may ask? To renew your mind works just like you renew a building. Take out the dirty old worn out, torn and unwanted stuff and replace them with new ones fitting to the eyes. It is the unwanted and dirty stuff in your mind that contends with the godly fruits coming from your spirit which are meant to make you a better person. They are there, but you don't see them. Why? Because your mind resists them. However, it is time to take action now, my friend. Prayerfully talk to God about the state of your mind and then ask Him to help you stand against everything that displeases Him right now. Now. Begin to intentionally focus on guarding the doorways of your mind. Watch what you feed your mind. Take back the control by controlling what goes in or through your mind. The kind of songs you listen to, the information or conversations you entertain, the things you watch and so on. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Re-educate your mind to accept your new realities of truth, love, purity, 
kindness, forgiveness, and so on that is in the good life. Deliberately oppose anything the media throws at you that does not glorify God. You begin to feed your mind with information that brings peace, boosts faith and confidence, strengthens you to stand out, and more. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 does tell us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Once your mind goes through this re-education process, it begins to open up to the transforming power of Christ flowing from your spirit. And when this happens, you will find the balance you have always desired. The control and transformation that your life needs will begin to manifest. It is what you give your mind that shapes your life. Are you willing to change that today? You can do this. It is very unusual to find someone who loves to stay in the dark. By default, life gravitates towards light and thrives in it, with only a few exceptions. Plants are known to grow in the direction of light. It is called phototropism. Animals and insects in particular are not left out of this. They are attracted to light, especially in a predominantly dark environment. If you live in the tropics, especially the remote areas, you can easily carry out a simple experiment to prove this. In essence, darkness repels. But there are times you will find yourself in the dark without knowing how you got there. It is that time when you don't like where you are and what is happening to you, yet you seem to be helplessly trapped in it. You are striving to meet your needs and get out of debt, but there is no progress. You are grappling with an ailment that is not responding to treatments. You desire a better life, but it seems to be getting worse. You want to give your family a better life, but you are struggling to survive. The only thing you do is search in hope of a solution. To keep making uncertain attempts, wishing they would turn out right. This is definitely not the plan of God for you. He did not place you in the dark. He does not want you there. If you open up to him, he will bring you out of the mess. But as long as you remain in the dark, you can only go round in circles. When a person is in the dark, there is only one thing they should desire, light. And when it comes, you will know the way out and the way forward. The Bible shows us that. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. When you begin to desire God's intervention, he will bring you his word because it is light. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalms 119 verse 130. To receive God is to receive his word. And this is where your victory begins. You see, the word of God first teaches you who you are in Christ. And then it gives you a proper perspective on the challenges you face. The next thing for you to do is to start speaking, declaring who God has made you in Christ and all that you have in him. When you do this, darkness cannot weigh you down. Instead, you will begin to rise above it in your mind. You will see yourself beyond it. The book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, plainly states that. For this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. As you do this consistently, the Spirit of God will navigate a way out of the darkness for you. He will create opportunities and position people in your path. You cannot have light and remain in the dark. But this could be the case if you are not applying the light with your mouth. This was the principle God put to work in creation. He observed that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was prevalent. What did he do? He applied light to the situation before him by speaking his word. If you are born of God, then you have the Holy Spirit in you, 
and his word is available to you. Put it inside you first by hearing and studying it. Then boldly voice it out in the area of your life that is in darkness. Darkness always and only responds to light, so the only lasting help that anyone can give you in darkness is light. When you have it, you will always be victorious over darkness, according to the Apostle John. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John chapter 1 verse 5. Do not seek a temporary solution. You may need it to overcome an emergency situation, but the ultimate answer is light. For instance, if you are under genuine financial pressure, you should reach out to someone for help, especially when you are unable to meet basic needs. But you need to go for light with respect to finances so that you don't perpetually depend on fellow men. Light here refers to the wisdom of God contained in the Bible. The Word of God is the light you need for victory when darkness overtakes any area of your life. Darkness can take various forms and have different causes, but the light remains the answer. The outbreak of an epidemic, family crisis, economic hardship, and insecurity are all forms of darkness. You can't always anticipate darkness or what form it will take, but when you have light, it will not take you unawares. This is one of the significant benefits when you decide to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Consider our Lord Jesus Christ while he was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days preparatory to his assignment. You could say that darkness came to him at that time because the devil tempted him and sought to mar his ministry from its onset. But Jesus got the victory over him again and again because he knew the written word of God and spoke it against the enemy. This is what you must do for victory to come when you find yourself in darkness. Worry, regret, complaining, anger, and blaming yourself or others will not give you victory over darkness. But this is how a lot of God's children respond. And if you do not have light, you will do the same. In Philippi, Paul and Silas were arrested, wrongly accused and beaten for demonstrating the power of God. They were thrown into prison, but see how they responded in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. They could do this because they had the light. They were kept in prison, but not away from God. Alleluia! They could not preach to anyone there, but they could pray and praise God. As dark as your situation is, there is something you can do about it, but you may not know until you have light. If the trouble is in your marriage, Diligently learn what the Bible teaches about it. Embrace it and apply it. Sometimes the light you need in the darkness is in the form of very simple instructions. In the book of John, chapter 5, there is an account of a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years and could not help himself. He had been abandoned and there was little hope that he would ever recover until light came to him in the person of Jesus Christ. All he needed to hear from Jesus was, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Jesus rightly described himself as the light of the world. So an encounter with him and a revelation of his redemption is the light that will bring you out of the darkness. When the light comes to you, you must recognize and apprehend it. Watch for it, pray for it, and wait for it. It may not give you an instant result, but stay with it. At creation, light prevailed over darkness. The beautiful state of the earth today is traceable to that application of light by the Almighty God. The light in Paul and Silas brought them out of the darkness as they applied it. It does not matter what activities you engage in. If they fall short of the light, you will not have victory. But the Bible declares that you will have been delivered from the power of darkness. Darkness only has power in the absence of light. What it does is blind your mind so that you are unable to access the victory. Light, on the other hand, brings you the relevant understanding. 
There are instances where darkness is self-inflicted. It can be the result of negligence and wrong decisions. A typical case in the Bible story of the prodigal son found in the book of Luke 15. The young man had left home with his portion of the inheritance, then wasted it until he was left with nothing. When he became hungry, he came to his senses and decided to find his way back home. It is possible for you to think your way back to where you made blunders that resulted in your present mess. You can do this by taking time to sincerely ponder how you got to where you are so that you can make the needed corrections. If you are broke today because your business packed up, could it be the result of mismanagement or perhaps a lack of diligence on your part? If you are sickly, could it be traceable to unhealthy habits? If you truly want to overcome the darkness, begin to take responsibility for your actions. And when you begin to shine amidst the darkness, you will become a light in your world. Do not explain the darkness or make excuses for it. Many lives and destinies are waiting to be changed by the brightness of your rising. No matter how dark it is, you can begin to conceive a victory in your mind. That's where it starts from. And your mind will work properly when it is renewed with the word of God. Deliberately connect with men and women who can bring you the word of God through their books and messages. Do not believe that the darkness will go away by itself, whether you do something about it or not. You must go for light. Otherwise, the darkness will persist. The devil does not give up until he realizes that you are full of light. Satan left Jesus Christ because he could not withstand the spoken word of God. Your mouth is your weapon against darkness, and you cannot be victorious when you are passive. Darkness is synonymous with confusion, uncertainty, fear, and lack of vision. There is no form of darkness in your life that someone somewhere has not faced or conquered. They may even be around. So locate them and let them share their experiences with you. You will be comforted and inspired. And if you are on the verge of giving up, your hope will be rekindled. God wants you to make progress no matter your shortcomings, and he is setting you on the right path. It is only the devil that wants you stuck and stagnated. He is full of deceit and trickery, constantly trying to draw you away from the light into the darkness. As a Christian, you can never be hopeless, no matter what has happened to you in the past or whatever you're facing. The Bible contains all the wisdom you need to be an overcomer in all aspects of your life. This entry was published the 1st of August, 2010.